Amen. I'm going to ask if Sam will take these and we'll give uh, some handouts tonight and uh, give those out. It looks like Mr. Matheson wants to help you, so he can do that too if he wants. And uh, take those handouts if you would. And we'll get started here in a minute. We'll go to Revelation chapter 4. Remind you a few things. We do have a very short business report after church tonight. Very short, just to give you a short update. And uh, and then we'll give you a better update in July uh, when all things settle down around here. Uh, Revelation chapter number 4. Revelation. I have a lot, and I feel like when I do this, it's kind of like packing a shotgun full of stuff and just blasting it, and I don't want to do that. I want it to be more orderly than that, but there's just a lot to cover and a lot of my mind, and so please bear with me, and uh, I'll do my best. Anybody else need a handout? I've got a few extras here. Anybody else need a handout? Putting out some of my props here. Everybody got a handout? Gunner didn't. Anybody else? All right. Revelation chapter 4. Before we get into Revelation chapter 4, you've got the handout. I want you to turn it to this side. And all it is, is it's Matthew chapter 24, 29 through 31 on one side in bigger print. On the other side, you've got Joel chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, Revelation chapter 6, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15. That's what I want to look at tonight. I just want to go over this with you. And of course, you have your Bible. And we'll get into Revelation chapter 4 in just a moment. But Matthew chapter 24 is on the left side in bigger print with arrows drawn, dissected, pointing to the chapters, the verses in other parts of the Bible. And remember, when we're studying Revelation you got to know the rest of the Bible to, to really understand and understand the end times. And so this title, I called it Rapture Timing. And uh, this is the question of a lot of things. And uh, people have always been taught, and, and if, uh, if you've been saved any length of time, and if you've listened to Christian radio or TV, and if you've gone to any church really that's talked about this particular topic, you've probably been taught that the rapture is going to happen before the tribulation, before the trouble and the real chaos starts. The rapture is going to take place. Well, I was taught that too until my pastor, who I had a lot of respect for, uh, I found out he didn't believe that. And I knew that, I knew that he knew the Bible. I knew that, um, that he was a student of the Bible. And, um, and so I thought, well, that's pretty goofy. This guy is pretty smart and pretty wise and, and a humble man at the same time. And he's a good pastor, a good leader. It's just a shame that he's wrong in this one area of his life. And then after a while, I started to wonder, I wonder if he's really wrong in that area of his life. I mean, he, what does he know that I don't know? Well, what I found out is, is that he studied the Bible versus his college notes or his um, latest, greatest, you know, late great planet earth books or whatever books that are out there at the time. He just started studying the Bible, all right, the King James Bible. And from it, from the word of God, he began to see some things that were different. And that's where he, he got that from. So... What happened is, is that over time, I asked him to give me uh, what he wrote. He wrote a thesis, and they, somebody gave him an earned doctorate for it. It's 101 thesis. It's in this book right here. And uh, so I take the book with me, and I use it. Uh, it's not all that I use, but I use it, and I've, I've read it and poured over it m many, many times. And the first time I read it, I pretty much went like this. Huh? And, uh, and so then I didn't read it again for a while, but as I matured and as I understood I started to understand a few more things a few more things and uh, and then I go back and reread things because I forget things and uh, and I, I'm I'm blessed uh, to have this it's not published I, I have a copy um, he gave it to me and, and he's no longer pastoring he's retired and he uh, doesn't always remember things like he used to so I'm glad he put it on print and put it in print and, and wrote it all down but <clears throat> the point I want to make is is if you go to Matthew 24 verse 29 through 31 Jesus is saying this, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. 
And then from that verse 29, I've drawn arrows over to Joel chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, and Revelation chapter 6, where it says, in prophecy, the sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Acts chapter 2 is a repeat of Joel chapter 2. And again, it's repeated. The sun shall be turned into darkness, verse 20, and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. As it come to pass, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then Revelation chapter 6, which is the sixth seal, and we'll talk about the seals a little bit tonight. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of the heaven fell upon the, unto the earth, and even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind, and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Well, when you compare those verses, the prophecy verses in Joel, and then what Peter said in Acts 2, and then what Revelation 6 says, you see that that lines up with what Jesus said in verse 29 of Matthew 24. Then verse 30 says, Matthew 24, 30, Jesus said, and then, all right, now, understand order of past, present tense, you know what I mean? <clears throat> After the tribulation, then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. I draw an arrow over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then, verse 31, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And again, pointing to the verses that we have over here, the trump of God will sound. And verse four, 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty two. in a moment, the twinkle of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. So there's a trumpet and it's apparently the last trumpet. And when it sounds, that's when he's going to gather his elect. Who are his elect? Does anyone want to venture who that is? It's the saved, the people who are born again, all right? And hopefully they're going to a church. Hopefully they're part of a church. But they are the saved of all people on the earth at that time, all right? And, uh, and yet, you know what? What I just said tonight is so grating and causes some people to blow a gasket, just what I said tonight. But I think that you can see those three verses in Matthew 24 and say that looks very simple and easy to follow. When it says, verse 29, after the tribulation, does it mean before the tribulation? I'm just asking for a friend. When it says, after the tribulation, it means after the tribulation. And when it says, after the tribulation, sun darkened, moon shall not give light, stars shall fall from heaven, powers of heaven shall be taken. And then you look at the prophecies and Joel and Acts and Revelation. It's like, it fits. Okay. <clears throat> then you go over to verse 30, Matthew 24, 30. You shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And we, we didn't read it all, but Acts chapter 1 says, as he rose up into the clouds, he'll come back into the clouds. First Thessalonians 4.16, he's going to descend from heaven with a shout, voice of the archangel, trump of God, dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds, in the clouds, in the air. And so, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then verse 31 of Matthew 24, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And yet, uh, there are people out there who will tell you that that is not the rapture. You have that all wrong. You're messed up in your mind. That's the Olivet Discourse, but that is not the rapture. You need to, you need to ignore those other verses. That's not where those fit. All right. Look with me in Mark chapter number 13. <clears throat> Mark chapter 13. These are parallel passages of the Olivet Discourse. Olivet, what is that? Mount of Olives, where Jesus was speaking. <clears throat> Mark 13, 27. Back up a little bit. Mark 13, 24. And, but in those days, after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars of heaven shall fall, the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in, in the clouds with great power and glory, and then shall he send his angels, and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. All right? That sounds the same. Look at Luke. Luke chapter 21. 
Luke chapter 21. Verse 25. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity and the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken and then shall they see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. Your redemption. Being redeemed, your your salvation, your old salvation complete. I mean, obviously you're already saved, but the redemption, the rapture of 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 your body to be present with the Lord forever. By the way, verse 26: Men's hearts failing them for fear, looking for those things which are coming on the earth. Uh, distress of nations. Verse 25: Perplexity. We're seeing that. I said it this morning. I feel like someone's like I'm inside of a snow globe, and someone grabbed it and went like this. You know. And, and, and that's what it seems to feel like right now. Uh, you cannot count on anything in this world. And I would recommend to you strongly that you count on the one thing and only thing that you can count on. And that's this book right here. You can't count on me because I'm a human being. I hope I don't fail you. But the only thing you can count on is the word of God. Trust it and read it and follow it and, and live it and do what it says. And when it says focus on this as important, make sure that you focus on that as being important. Make sure you focus on what God, fo God focuses on. Understand that you cannot necessarily count on what you've been taught or led to believe uh, to be your friend or to be on your side. There's just a lot of stuff happening right now that are it, it's wrong and it makes no sense. I don't understand why I'm told over and over again that the Republicans are better than the Democrats. Now, I understand on paper why. I, I get that. And, I, and by the way, I've already voted. I voted absentee. And you should vote this week. And uh, I voted for good conservative candidates. And I voted for people that most of them not the establishment, even here in South Dakota. But you know what? It was George W. Bush that appointed John Roberts to the Supreme Court. And John Roberts... The only thing I know him for is that when Obamacare passed, it was because he's, he leaned that way. And then this week, when the state of California was, was being challenged concerning churches staying open, he leaned with the left side. If he had voted with Kavanaugh and those other conservatives uh, that, that are on, the state of California churches would have been okay, but they're not. That didn't come from a Democratic appointee. That came from a Republican appointee. Understand that you can't, you can't count on that stuff. All right? Somebody said it. Somebody commented on it on a post, and I agreed with the comment. I wonder who's got what on John Roberts. Obviously, somebody's got something. Here's the point. You can count on the word of God, and you can try to do it your way, and you can try to uh, stick bumper stickers of politicians on your bumper all you want to, but it won't be long before you'll be scraping them off. Because they'll let you down. Understand that. But you can count on the word of God. So stick to it. Understand it. And allow it to lead and guide your, your, th your thoughts and your mind and your life. So back to what I'm talking about tonight. There's just lots of garbage going on. Coronavirus. Some little boy asked his father, Dad, why are people burning down stores? And why are people beating each other up in the streets? And somebody said, because the coronavirus is wearing off and the murder hornets didn't work. <laughs> I don't know. But it's sad. But you know why I'm not losing my mind? I got the Bible. I have the Bible. And the Bible said men's hearts would fail for, because of fear. The Bible said there would be perplexity and distress of nations. The Bible said these things would come. There would be tribulation before he comes. And what I'm seeing are Christians who are spineless Christians who remind me of the story of, of the eagle who uh, flew over this farm and looked down and saw these, these other fowl down there eating and really enjoying themselves. And so he landed and started feeding on the corn. And the eagle started eating with all these other turkeys that were, and the farmer would come out and the farmer would, would uh, you, know, you know, feed them and, 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 and allow them to eat some more and and uh, the eagle and, and these others were, were eating together. And pretty soon the eagle, he just got so, hey, there's no sense flying anywhere. I might as well just, I get free food here. I get taken care of here. And then after a while, he saw some other birds of his kind going across back, 
back migrating back the other way, and he said, ah, I better take off. He couldn't take off. He's too fat. He's too lazy. He couldn't take off. He was a captive. I think there's a lot of Christians like that. Hey, we're, hey, we're going to get zapped out of here before it gets bad. And now all of a sudden we find out it's getting bad and my strength isn't what it should be. And they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength and mount up with wings as eagles. But I have been trusting in the Lord. I've been trusting in a doctrine that I was taught. And so here we are tonight talking about something that I, I, I want you to understand. This is, this is a serious issue. And I think that a lot of churches are spineless uh, and, and led to confusion. There's lots, of course, Bible versions out there now. And nobody knows for sure what the Bible says. And um, we're turning to the gurus and the experts to ask, ask them for their opinion, what it should say. Now, back to Revelation chapter 4. Here we go. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1. Now, what I want to do is I want to read to you, I told you that Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and Luke 21, according to the prophecy experts, are not the rapture. But instead, here's where the rapture starts. You know, we've been studying Revelation 1, Revelation 2, and Revelation 3. We've been studying the churches, the seven churches. And I told you how that the book of Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ and the salutation to the seven churches is at the beginning and then at the very end of Revelation, it mentions the church again. But in the body of the letter, it doesn't mention the church, but that doesn't mean it isn't still written to the churches. It is. But they try to say that because church isn't mentioned in chapter 4 all the way to chapter 20, 21, that therefore it's no, lo it, it, it's no longer has anything to do with the church. However, uh, that's, I think, a very silly thing. But here's what they do. They say, so church is done. In chapter 4, verse 1, after this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice, which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit. All right. I just read to you their proof text or one of their proof texts for why the rapture is right there. You saw it real clearly, didn't you? Let me read it again. After this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit. And that, that's the rapture. I, I have a book here. I have a book here, Tim LaHaye and Thomas Ice. Inside there's a chart. And they say, now that, that verse isn't the only verse, but their chart shows Revelation 4, verse 1, rapture. First Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 and 17. That's, the, that's what the chart shows. That's the rapture. That's it right there. Did you see it? You must have blinked if you didn't see it. All right, because, I, I mean, that's it. That's, that's it. And you say, well, what do they? T how can they get that? Well, because the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet. <gasps> trumpet. Talking with me. And said, come up hither. And so a trumpet. A voice sounding like a trumpet said, come up hither. And so I went up immediately. I was in the spirit. That's, that's it. That's it. You know, what's funny about, about this group is they say that people like me spiritualize the text. In other words, instead of, instead of taking clear, literal uh, approach to the verses, they, we, we, we just spiritualize it and make it say things. Who's making what say things there? In Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, you know, the one thing that I would say, obviously, they didn't take into consideration is go back to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. Revelation chapter 1, verse 9 says, I'm, a, I'm your brother and companion in tribulation. Revelation chapter 1, verse 10 says, and I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Well, why can't I say that Revelation chapter 1, verse 10 is the rapture? If we want to talk about trumpets... If that's, if that's it, and, and so that's, that's, their, that's where they say the, the rapture happens is chapter 4. Why do they say that? Because that's how their system is set up. Their set up, their whole system is set up for the rapture to start in chapter 4, and everything that we read in chapter 4 is now future for us. Now, question, how long ago did John write this? 1,900 years ago, 1,900 and some years ago almost 2,000 years ago. So Jesus is telling John, I'm going to show you things that are about to happen, that are going to happen hereafter, 
All right? Miss Wilma, don't worry about the hail. Your strawberries will be good next year. Jesus is showing John something that's about to happen. They're saying, no, no, this is for us, us in the future, okay? All right? Um, and and it, this is a, an independent Baptist who, who uses the King James. He's a church out in California, a very large church out in California. And um, it's Paul Chapel, and uh, some of you know who that is, and Lancaster Baptist Church out there. And the foreword was written by John Getch, who's been here, and we, we, we like these people. They're, they're one of us. But he's written Understanding the Times, and I'll just, I'll just read something that he's written. Um, and the, it's just the title, Because the Church is Absent in Revelation from 4 to 18. All right? And that's just the normal protocol to think that and to be taught that. That's what they're taught. You say, well... Well, those are very important people. No, they all repeat themselves, okay? It's, it's, I, I don't mean to compare them to evolutionists, but that's exactly what it is. It's like the evolutionists who repeat each other and say, well, we, you know, we, we found the missing link. Where is it? Well, well Dr. So-and-so has it. And you find out nobody's got it. They just repeat themselves, okay? Um, I, I have a friend, I have a friend who, um, who commented on this book here. Look at that thing. To the seven churches, a commentary on the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. And uh, it's written by a guy named Thomas Strauss. And uh, so I, I open it up, and, and here's what I find concerning this very subject we're talking about. He, 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 he kind of ridicules another author, and he says, Johnson is an example of one who does not have the ear to hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. In other words, he's not listening to the Lord like he should. When he ill-advisedly favors the following unbiblical sentiment, saying there is no good reason for seeing the invitation for John to come up into the opened heaven as a symbol of the rapture of the church. And so he's, he's agreeing with the idea that, that John being called up to heaven in the spirit is a symbol of the rapture of the church. But you know what? That's a silly, that's a silly thing. You know what? John is simply being relocated in the spirit in heaven. By the way, if you know anything about the rapture, is it our spirit that goes or is it our whole body? Did John bodily go to heaven? No, he was caught up in the what? In the spirit. And you know what? The apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 had the same revelation. He was out, it, it was an out of body experience. He was caught up into the third heaven, Paul said, and he saw things. And, and John and Paul, were, things were revealed to them. Uh, and, and why? Because they were to write and to write things concerning prophecy. And it is John and Paul that I quote mostly here, even as a, in this subject. And so he's in the throne room of God. But this is no, this in no way is good doctrine to say that this is concrete proof. But I have been told over and over again that that is proof. Now, he said, where does all come from? Answer. This book right here, this is about 100 years old now, over 100 years old. It's called the Schofield Reference Bible. This Schofield Reference Bible was introduced to America back in 1909, 1917 is the one here. And, of course, I don't mean to say that I have a, a 1917 edition, but I have a, a carbon copy of it, the 1917. And uh, this Schofield Reference Bible used the King James. However, in the front, he, he says right in the very front introduction, he said, I only use the King James because it's the popular one. I really think there's some others that are better. Um, and, and yet there are, there are lots of guys who, who, when they talk about their King James, they mean this one, all right? And uh, when I was a boy, uh, I remember preachers saying, turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 25 or Habakkuk chapter number two. And if you're in a... If you've got the right Bible, it's on page 956, because that's, that's this one. Anybody here hear that before? There's some people raising their hands back there. And, and so it was promoted. It was promoted. Guess which is the most cheap, most inexpensive Bible to buy today? This one right here. Someone's funded this one. Uh, Schofield didn't have any money when this came out. Somebody funded this. It's an interesting study as to how that all happened. But what you need to understand is, is that he questions the Bible in the margins, and he also says stuff in the notes at the bottom that go contrary to what the Bible says. Now, he'll list references, and he'll say, according to these references, and, and a lot of us are lazy enough to not go look up the references to see what he's talking about. Anyhow, Mr. Schofield was, Mr. Schofield was a lawyer turned preacher. Uh, his wife divorced him, which was very rare 100 years ago. And 
as soon as he got divorced, he remarried this other woman. And uh, there's a lot of scuttle and scandal concerning Mr. Schofield. And uh, he said enough in his notes to make me wonder if he's really in heaven. I don't mean to be unkind, but I have questioned some things. I really do. Anyhow, in Revelation chapter 4, under Revelation chapter 4, in his notes, it says at the bottom of the page, 1,334, it says, when John is said in verse 1, come up hither, he says, Schofield says, this call, this call seems clearly to indicate the fulfillment of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 concerning the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will rise first. This, this call clearly indicates the fulfillment of the rapture. The word church does not again occur in Revelation till all is fulfilled. So do you see where these gather guys are getting it from? They're getting it from this 100 years ago. This is the ringleader. This is where it all started. And it infiltrated churches and pastors started using this and they were given this. You might have heard this, this school, Dallas Theological Seminary. Dallas Theological Seminary was started by Lewis Sperry Chafer. Lewis Sperry Chafer was a disciple of Mr. Schofield. All right. So really, Dallas Theological Seminary is a Schofield school. Well, who's graduated from Dallas Theological Seminary? Well, have you ever heard of David Jeremiah? Have you ever heard of uh, Jeffers down in Texas? I mean, all, all your TV preachers and, and radio preachers. All right, that's, that's where, and so they all have the same slant. They all have the same bent. Oh, also, by the way, now you can buy this in several modern Bible versions. The notes stay the same at the bottom, but the Bible is negotiable. Okay, are you following me? All right, so I learned all this. And as I learned this, I started to realize, okay, <clears throat> so what's happening is, is that just like people who study evolution, they just take what the professor says and believe it, swallow it, regurgitate it, and repeat it like parrots, and that's how, and then it gets passed. And then, and then the young preacher comes out, and he preaches it, and, of course, the people in the pew are, okay, you know, I mean, this, or whatever. Uh, and so, and so it, I... There's another note in there. I haven't read that one yet. I'll, I will hopefully if I don't run out of time here tonight. So if you'll stop interrupting me, we'll get faster here. All right. Uh, Revelation chapter four. And let's keep going. After this, I looked and behold, a door was open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one set on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald, and round about the throne were four and twenty elders, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold, and out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of the fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast was like a calf, and the third beast had the face of a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle, and the fourth beasts had each of them six wings about him and they were full of eyes within and they rest not day and night saying holy 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 lord god almighty which was and is and is to come and when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying thou art worthy O lord to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created now what was that all about well let's try to dissect it and quickly go through it first of all let's talk about the four and twenty elders who are these four and twenty elders well i believe that the four and twenty elders uh and and uh there's more i could say about john and representing the rapture and i i need to stop and and keep going but um first of all in the rapture, the, the saints in heaven come down to meet the saints in the earth, and they meet in the air. Did you see the four and twenty elders meet John in the air anywhere? Of course not. 
Um, and of course, at the end of Revelation, John's back on the earth saying, even so come Lord Jesus. This is not a good picture of the rapture, no matter what they say. It's a silly uh, representation, and it certainly is spiritualizing uh, rather than taking the Bible literally, okay? But anyhow, talking about these four and 20 elders, um, uh, I want to just say that I believe that these four and 20 elders represent a certain group of people. And uh, I think the Bible helps us to understand that. Uh, first of all, uh, Isaiah chapter 24 and verse 20, 23, I'll read that to you quickly, and then I'll show you some things in uh, Revelation and other parts of the New Testament. But Isaiah 24, 23 Then the moon shall be confounded, the sun ashamed, when the Lord of hosts shall reign in the Mount Zion in Jerusalem and before his ancients gloriously. The word ancient is the same idea, the same word as elder. Uh, the idea of, of these elders being round about the throne, and we'll talk about who, obviously whose throne is it. It's God's throne, all right? Round about the throne of God, and here's these, these four and 20 elders, all right? Now, um, who could this be? Well, go with me to... Um, Matthew chapter 19 and Luke chapter 22. Matthew 19. I'm going to ask Bob to read Luke 22 for me just for the sake of time. But I'm going to read Matthew 19. And uh, Bob can read Luke 22, 24 through 30. Matthew 19 and verse 27 and 28. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye, shall, ye which have followed me in the re regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon the twelve thrones, judging upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. All right? And then Luke chapter 22, Bob, if you would, 20, 24 through 30. Yes. All right. Okay. And then I want to go to Ephesians chapter number two. Ephesians chapter two. I, I believe that the four and 20 elders, 24, is 12 times two. And I believe that in the Old Testament, you'll find God's people represented in a group called in the Old Testament, God's people were represented by a, a nation called, and those that nation was made up of 12 tribes. In the New Testament, you have the 12 apostles, all right? Obviously, Judas was replaced, but you have the 12 apostles, all right? And so Ephesians chapter number 2, I want to read starting in verse number 11. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past, Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus you were sometimes afar, were afar off or made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who has made, hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. By the way, God is not a racist. The Bible says God is no respecter of persons. The Bible says right there that God has broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Did you know in the Old Testament, if you were a Gentile, you couldn't go in to the holy, the holy, holy, holy place in the holiest of all. You couldn't go into the holy place. You couldn't go into the tabernacle proper. If you were a Gentile, you weren't allowed into those, those places. You were considered second class if you weren't a descendant of Abraham. Do you know that there are people today that are very racist in their theology? 
it's impossible for me to teach Revelation without tearing down something. And that is the wrong concept of Israel. Okay? I, I'm, I'm totally against racism. There's only one race, and it's the human race. And we're all of one blood. And there, there, really, there really doesn't need to be a black church. And there doesn't need to be a white church. The church should have one color, and that's the red church for the blood of Jesus Christ. The only reason why you might have a Chinese church or a Spanish church is because of the language. The language barrier, not because of the skin. All right? And I am so opposed. And there's, there's a teaching. There's a teaching out there that says that white people shouldn't marry black people. I was taught that when I was a kid. I was taught that that's what the Bible teaches. The Bible doesn't teach that. Okay? The Bible teaches that unsaved people shouldn't marry saved people. Saved people shouldn't marry unsaved people. Okay? That's what the Bible teaches. That's unequally yoked. All right? And so there's a lot of prejudice, all right, in churches. There's prejudice, though, concerning the nation of Israel. I, I, think, I think churches are, are very prejudiced when it comes to Israel versus the Palestinians. You know the Palestinians have souls? No, pastor, they're all terrorists. I don't know who told you that, but that isn't true. And not only is that not true, there are Israelis who are terrorists. Okay? Um, I, I don't mean to get off on a rabbit trail too much here, but he made both one, and he broke down the partition between us. Church is the melting pot of everybody under Jesus Christ. That's what this nation used to be, a melting pot. We didn't, we didn't used to have hyphenated Americans. You, you came to this country, no matter what color you were, no matter what language you spoke, you were what? American. Now you have hyphenated American. Okay? And there's segregation and, and all that. And I'm, I'm against all of it. It's wrong, but it's wrong on all levels and on all, in, in all ways. It's wrong. For he is our peace who hath made both one and broken down the middle wall partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Did you know that in Galatians there was a real rift because Peter was eating with the Gentiles and then he was eating with the Jews and there was, why can't they eat together, you know? But there was, it was, it was a, there was, there was prejudice and there was, there was just issues there. All right. And so what did he do? He, he tore all that down when he died on the cross and came and preached peace to you that were afar off and to them that were nigh. For through him, we both have access by one spirit unto the father. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And here's my point. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles, that's New Testament, and prophets, that's Old Testament, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. You know what you and I are going to ultimately become? The house of God, the temple of God. The Bible says at the end of Revelation that we are the temple of God. We, the temple is the bride of Christ. Revelation chapter 21, it says... The new Jerusalem, the city, the, 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 the city of God, the holy dwelling of God. And Revelation 21, verse 1 and 2, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And then verse 11, having the glory of God well, let's just read verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, that holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Hold on, stop a second. Here. <clears throat> Did you notice in chapter 21, verse 2, it said a new Jerusalem? Then we need to stop fighting over this old one. All right? That is a waste of time. And, and if I was talking to Palestinians who were mad because they got their land stolen from them by Jewish settlers, and that's happening right now, I would tell those Palestinians, I sympathize, I understand, I, I agree it's not fair, but if you want it back, you know what you need to do? Get saved and wait for Jesus to come back, because then he's going to make he's gonna make a new Jerusalem, and, and there's going to be a millennium, a thousand-year reign. You want it back, 
Quit throwing bombs. Quit fighting and just trust the Lord. The meek shall inherit the earth, okay? If I was talking to the Jews, I'd tell them, quit, quit taking land. It's going to melt anyway. Quit fighting over this old Jerusalem. It's the new one you should be focused on, not the old one. All right? Verse, verse 11, having the glory of God and her, and her light, so it's referring to this new Jerusalem as a female, was like unto a stone most precious, like even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. And on the east three gates, and on the north three gates, and on the south three gates, and on the west three gates, and the wall of the city had twelve foundations. Foundations are different than gates. And in them, the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Do you see 24 there? You see Old Testament 24, and you, or 12, and you see a New Testament 12, and it adds up to 24. I just think that's what the 24 elders represent in Revelation chapter 4. I think it's just a representation of all of the saints in the Old and New Testament made up of the tribes and the apostles as, as an example, as, as, as by way of illustration. I hope you didn't get lost with that, but I hope that helped you to understand that. Go back to Revelation chapter 4. Now, there's not only these 24 elders, but there's also these four beasts or creatures. And these four beasts are very strange. They're not human. They're something else. And what are they exactly? No one can say absolutely dogmatically for sure. However, it does seem that these four beasts match up with the four living creatures in Ezekiel chapter 1 and Ezekiel chapter 10. It's almost word for word, only some slight differences between the two. In Revelation chapter 4 and verse number 6, it says in the middle of the verse, And round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf, the third beast had the face of a man, the fourth beast had a beast was like a flying eagle, and the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, holy. Holy, holy, Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. So who are these? What are these? Well, I believe that these are cherubs and or seraphs, seraphims. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 6, it says that I saw the seraphims high and lifted up. And the seraphims had six wings. And with twain they covered their face, with twain they covered their feet, and with twain they did fly. And they cried, holy, holy, holy. My understanding of a seraph, and by the way, a cherubim and a seraphim are the only heavenly creatures that we know of that have wings. Angels are never listed to have wings in the Bible. Angels have never said to have wings. But how many of us have been brainwashed to think that angels have wings? It's the cherubim and the seraphim. You say, well, what is a seraphim? It's a cherub with six wings. Well, what's a cherub? A cherub with four wings. That's all I know. And the way I can remember it is seraphim starts with S and six wings start with, starts with S. That's how I remember it. But a cherub, and now it's interesting. We're in Revelation. The first time you read about cherub is in Gal or Genesis when there was two cherubs standing before the Garden of Eden, not letting Adam and Eve go back in. So Genesis has them, and now we see it in Revelation. By the way, Lucifer was the anointed cherub that covereth. He was a cherub, but he fell. And became proud and fell, as the Bible says in Isaiah and uh, Ezekiel. Now, who are these cherubs, these beasts, these creatures? Well, I think they're cherub. I think they could represent cherubs. I think that's what they are. I think Ezekiel talks about them in chapter 1 and chapter 10. In fact, the only difference in Ezekiel you'll find is instead of it being a face of a calf, it's the face of an ox. But a calf and an ox are pretty much the same thing. Uh, the wings, there's four wings instead of six. Again, I don't know. I don't know if maybe they earned a couple wings or something after a couple thousand years. I don't know. You know, Clarence Oddbody. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know everything there is to know about the cherubs and the seraphim. All right. I just know that they're not human. And I know that their job is to cry holy, holy, holy around the throne of God. I also know that they're full of eyes. 
They say, that sounds creepy. Well, I just think that represents the omniscience of God and the, the spirit of, of being able to see uh, all places at once. But I also think they represent something else because I think that they represent the four winds, the four directions, the four sides, uh, the four gospels. And uh, Matthew, it's interesting that Matthew represents Jesus as the son of David of the tribe of Judah, the lion, all right? The lion of the tribe of Judah. In fact, chapter 5 calls him the lion of the tribe of Judah, all right? And so I think it's, it's quite possible that these could also be the gospels, the four gospels. Now, who do the four gospels point to? What are the four gospels about? Who are the four gospels about? Jesus Christ. And so Matthew, representing the lion of the tribe of Judah, and by the way, his face is east, the place of kings, Revelation 16. Uh, and uh, so he's, he's facing east. Then you have Mark. Mark is the one that's the face of the ox or the calf, uh, the cherub, all right? And it, apparently the cherub's face was like an ox or a calf. And the idea of the ox being a servant, that's what they used the oxen for, was for a service animal to pull uh, heavy, heavy loads. And uh, it was facing south and this is not a racial statement at all, but if you study history and you look at Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and you look at the descendants, you see that Canaan, Canaan went south and uh, into Africa. And I'm not saying anything about color of skin when I say that, but it, 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 the Bible prophesies that they would serve. They would be servants, okay? And so we see here, we see here the idea of servant. And Jesus was not only the son of David, but he was also the servant, all right? And then Luke, the son of man. Luke represents Jesus as the son of man. And instead of seeing the lineage of David, like you do in Matthew, you see the lineage back to Adam as you see it in Luke, because he's the son of man. He was truly man, but he was also God. And, his, and, and, the, and this beast here, the, the Luke representations facing westward, general direction of civilization. Did you know that if you study history, you realize that civilization has pretty much always kind of moved west? I'm not saying never east, but the majority of civilization has moved westward around the globe, kind of like the sun moves east to west. And then also John, the son of God. When you read the book of John, the very first thing you read is in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. The word was God. And yet he is the only begotten son of God. And the face of an eagle, what does an eagle do? It rises above all other birds and uh, facing northward, the location of God's throne. Is Mount Zion in the sides of the north, the city of the great king? Let me just read you uh, what my pastor had written here uh, years ago because he reminds, every time he's writing, he reminds everybody that this Revelation book is all about Jesus. And he said, they show us, these four creatures show us the true picture of the Lamb, who only was worthy to open the seven-sealed book. He came to earth the first time to serve his father. Thus he became the sacrificial calf, the serving calf, the sacrificial calf, neither by the blood of bulls and goats, but by his own blood. <clears throat> and so we see the calf represented here. Then he turned westward with the gospel message to reach the hosts of mankind. As civilization moved west, the gospel moved west. You know, Paul wanted to go a certain direction, and God said, no, I want you to go this direction. And the gospel moved in a more westerly direction. It just did. He then went into the sides of the north to sit at the right hand of God. When he died on the cross and rose again, he, he went to the sides of the north and dwells at the right hand of the Father, waiting his time. And he will come again to the Middle East to reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. And so he, he points that out, and I wanted to mention that to you. Now, let's go back and read Revelation chapter 4, having explained the four beasts, the four and 20 elders. And let's go back and talk about the rest of this, and I'll talk about the rest of the handout. <clears throat> and it says here in verse number 2, And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunders and uh, thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of the fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. We talked about how that God is one spirit, but he is split into seven. And Isaiah tells us that those 
those there's just seven attributes of one spirit of God and before the throne there was a sea of glass like into crystal and in the midst of the throne round about the throne and uh, we've read the rest already we go down to the bottom of verse 11 thou art worthy O Lord to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created if you'll take your hand out and turn to the opposite side I've given you a sketch of the tabernacle or temple system and the tabernacle or temple system is laid out here before us. And what I believe that Revelation hints at to us enough with enough detail is to show us some things concerning the tabernacle in heaven. I was just reading in my Bible reading this week, Hebrews. The book of Hebrews and other places tells us, but especially Hebrews tells us, that when Moses built the tabernacle, he built it after the original in heaven. The tabernacle that they had out there in the wilderness was not the original. It was patterned after the original in heaven. All right? So with that in mind, we see some things as we start to see heaven. Remember, John is seeing heaven, and he's seeing the throne of heaven. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 19, the very last verse, it says, just like it says in chapter 4, there's lightnings and thunderings, and the ark of God is revealed there in heaven, in the temple of God in heaven, all right? And so just like the Holy of Holies had the Ark of God. Now, what is the lid called of the Ark of God? The what? The, mer the mercy seat. We have the throne of God. No one, no one dares sit on that seat, but God himself, the throne of God. So we see the throne room of heaven, the throne room of heaven, the Holy of Holies. Then if you look at verse five of chapter four, it says, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. You know how many lamps the candlestick had? How many candles were on the candlestick? By the way, a Jewish menorah today has nine. That's not biblical. The biblical lamp stand had seven. All right. So is it just coincidence that we're reading seven lamps of fire burning? All right. And, uh, and then... Uh, we have, of course, the table of showbread with 12 loaves. And I've already talked about the 12 times 2. We've gone over that. Let me show you a few other things about the 12 times 2 that I think are worth looking at right now. Let's go back to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter number 1. Ephesians chapter number 1. And verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is the, his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Where is Jesus Christ tonight? Where is he according to the Bible? He is in heaven at where? At the right hand of the Father. Usually seating at the right hand of the Father. Sitting at the right hand of the Father. Seated at the right hand of the Father. That's where Jesus Christ is. And we'll look at a lot of verses. Now, look at chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together. And made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Do you, where are you tonight? You say, uh, Treg's looking at me. Uh, I think I'm here. In Christ, where are you tonight? You're sitting next to the Father also. There's a song I, I played when I was a kid. I've got a reservation. Remember I was talking about, about that anchor of our soul and how the anchor is already in the harbor? That's what this is talking about. According to, we're already seated you, you, don't, you don't have to worry about losing your salvation. You already have a reservation in heaven. It's already secure, okay? It's there. You're seated in heavenly places. You know why you're seated in heavenly places? Because you're in him. Seated in Christ in heavenly places. The only reason why you're in anywhere good is because of Jesus. It's in Christ that we're anything, okay? And so when we see this, we realize we're, it, we're there too. 
We're there. That's why all 24 are represented, Old and New Testament saints together. By the way, the doctrine of dispensationalism, the, the doctrine of Schofield, the doctrine of so many, they say, no, the Old Testament saints, they say, listen to this, they say the Old Testament saints don't rapture when we do. They say that when the trumpet sounds, it's just the New Testament saints that go and the Old Testament saints have to wait. Because I'll explain that later. Now, notice back in Revelation chapter 4. I'm sorry, but I, there's just a lot here. And you just have to buckle your seatbelt. That's why we're recording it too. So I can figure out all the things I said wrong, get it straightened out. Revelation chapter 4 again. Verse 6. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal in the midst of the throne, round about the throne. Do you know that not only did the tabernacle or the temple have the ark and the mercy seat, the holy of holies and the lampstand and the table of showbread, but out in front there was the laver. And the laver was filled with what? Water. And do you know what the laver was made out of? The women's looking glasses. The polished brass that was like a mirror. And so that you could go up to the labor and look into the shiny reflection of water and metal and see yourself and wash yourself. We see a sea of glass here. No more need to wash now, but still see the reflection. We see the sea here. All right. Then when you get to chapter five and we'll just sneak over to chapter five for a minute and you look at verse eight. It says, and when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four twenty elders fell down before the lamb, every, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of the odors. What are those? That's not Sam and Gunner and Daniel. Okay. What? No, it's incense. It's incense full of the incense. And what is that? The prayers of the saints. Look at your map. The altar of, it's little tiny right before the veil. The altar of what? The altar of incense. Do you see the picture? Are you starting to see? John was getting a picture of the heavenly temple. That's what he was looking at in chapter 4 and 5. You see, God was, God was giving Moses a pattern of what it looks like in heaven. And Hebrews tells us that. And the lampstand is there and the altar of incense is pictured there and the prayers of the saints and, and the 12 is represented times two and, and, and the ark is still an ark and there's the holy of holies. There's a sea of glass out front. But how come there's no brazen altar? How come we don't read about a brazen altar there? Because the brazen altar, what was the purpose of it? To offer the sacrificial animal. Well, there doesn't need to be that in heaven. You know why? The lamb's been slain from the foundation of the world. There's no more slaughter. There was no more need for the bloodshed anymore. You know what else is not mentioned in, in our chapters in Revelation? You know what else we don't see? A veil between the holiest of all and the holy place. You know why? Because when Jesus died on the cross, the veil was ripped in two. And we can come boldly to the throne of grace and find grace and mercy and find help and grace in time of need. We can come boldly to the throne. We can, we can enter into the throne of God because of him. It says in Hebrews chapter 9. Uh, well, yeah, I'll just turn there. I want to read it to you. Hebrews chapter 9. And verse 8. The Holy Ghost signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure of the time then present. Not yet made manifest, but it is now. And then look at chapter 10, verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And so we see that we can now come boldly, as it says in Hebrews chapter 4, to the throne of grace and find help and mercy in the time of need. So what we see here in Revelation 4 is we're seeing these four cherubim, creatures, these 24 who I believe represent Old and New Testament saints, apostles and prophets, and the throne room of God and the temple of God in heaven. Now we get to chapter 5, and I just want to quickly go over chapter 5, and then I'll go back the next time we get together and talk about Revelation. I'll go back 
and I'll give you more detail about Revelation 5, and then we'll go on to chapter 6, because then it'll get, it'll start to go deeper, all right? So Revelation chapter 5, and I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within an, and, and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Now, back then, I'm looking for my book. Where did I put it? Oh, did it fall on the ground? Oh, there it is. Uh, I don't think their books back then look like our books today, bound as we bind them in the backside like this. I don't think that was how they, they could have. I, I could be wrong. But I think when it says written on the inside and outside, of course, we have print on the, both sides of the pages, you know. But uh, sealed with seven seals. The, the typical book back then was a scroll. And I forgot to bring my pocket knife in here. But I, I used very holy seals called Scotch 3M tape. And uh, those are my seals, okay? So as I begin to, I pull seal number one, and as I begin to pull it out, and as I begin to, uh, to unravel it, you start to see writing on this side, and you start to see writing on this side. And then as, as I rip off seal number two, it starts to unravel a little more, and you start to see more and more. And see, do you see the picture what I'm trying to tell you here? I think that's kind of the, the idea here of the book sealed with seven seals. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that some more. But Revelation chapter 5, I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne, that would be God, a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of, of the four beasts, and the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book and the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song saying, thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands and thousands. I'm not very good at math, but that's over a hundred million, I believe. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said amen and the four and twenty elders fell down and worshiped him that liveth forever and ever. And then from here we're going to open each seal and look at what it means. Now, if you're of the pre-tribulation crowd... You believe that the rapture happened in chapter 4 and that all this is part of the future tribulation stuff. But when is the lamb worthy to open the seals? Is he, is he sitting on the throne next to the, at the right hand of the Father? Is he already worthy? Was John not seeing him being sung to and praised as worthy? Is he worthy now or is he worthy later? Is he worthy now or later? You see, this book, I think, is a title deed. And I don't have time to go into all this tonight. But this, this idea of a title deed and, and the idea of, of land covenant and, and property ownership, you go back to Leviticus 25 and you see some of this. When a title deed was, was sealed, it was only to be opened by the heir, by the one who owns it. Who is the rightful heir? Who's worthy to open this book? No one. I wept much because no man was found worthy. And one of the elders provided good news. Verse 5. Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the, of the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book. 
Now, I don't know, but I, I like to use my silly imagination here. And since I believe that the four and 20 elders made up of tribes of Israel and apostles of, of the New Testament, my guess is, is it's probably Judah that said, Lion of tribe of Judah is willing. He can do it. Yeah, I mean, after all, that's one of his descendants, right? I mean, if you were Judah, wouldn't you want to say, hey, hey, David and Jesus came out of my tribe, you know, uh, humanly speaking. And so he says, weep not, there is one that is worthy. Lion of the tribe of Judah, sovereignty and power, as the Bible says. Genesis 49, verse 9 and 10. The only other place you'll find this mentioned is here. Genesis 49, verse 9 and 10. I don't know if it's the only other place. It's one of the most prominent places. It says, just as Jacob's prophecy to his 12 sons. Genesis 49. Now, here we are looking at Genesis, talking about Revelation. You see how it all goes together? Genesis 49, verse 9. Judah is a lion's whelp, Jacob said. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched or crouched as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. You know, the scepter has always been in the line of Judah. The scepter being the kingly line and David's line. All the way down, and you read uh, Matthew in the, in the lineage of David in Matthew chapter 1, and you get all the way down, and we talked about those women that are part of that lineage as well a few weeks ago. And Jesus is of the line, he's the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, the root of David. Root meaning foundation. By the way, root is interesting. Remember, Jesus is talking in, in the Gospels, and he repeats Psalm 110. And, and Jesus says, you know, in Psalm 110, not that, not that Psalm 110 actually had divisions back then, but, you know, back in the Psalms, it says, David said, the Lord said unto my Lord. And they said, whose son is the Messiah? Whose son is the Christ? Well, he is David's son. Well, then why would David say the Lord said unto my Lord? If, 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 if it's David's son, why would David call his son Lord? Because the root was around before the fruit. Mr. Pryor knows that's true. Root comes before fruit. And Jesus was before David, and Jesus is of David. But Jesus was really before David. And so he's the root of David, as well as the offshoot of David. He's the lamb. And notice it says, as it had been slain. It's done. It's finished. Chapter 13, verse 8 says, a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And seven horns, that means he's powerful, completely powerful. Seven eyes, he's completely omniscient. He can see everything. And he's in the midst of the throne. He is the center of attention. He is the center of everything. As if he had been slain, but he's still alive. And what is he doing? He's sitting at God's right hand. He is there. Where is Jesus Christ tonight? He is sitting at God's right hand. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit here until my, I make thine enemies thy footstool. And that's what Jesus is doing. He is sitting next to the Father at the right hand of the Father, watching God carry all this out until it's time for him to claim it all. But he's already sitting in heavenly places. He's already sitting at the Father's right hand. Pastor, why do you keep saying that? Why do you keep emphasizing that? Well, because the Bible emphasizes it. And I want to tell, tell you something else. I, I want to tell you something else about this wonderful, ridiculous, retarded Schofield notes that are in here. Revelation chapter 4. The first note that you read in Revelation chapter 4, when it talks about the throne of God, it says this passage, and then it lists a bunch of verses that supposedly back up what it says, and they're not, they don't. This passage is conclusive that Christ is not now seated upon his own throne. This passage is conclusive that Christ is not now seated upon his own throne. The Davidic covenant and the promises of God through the prophets and the angel Gabriel concerning the messianic kingdom await fulfillment. No, he already is king and he is on the throne. And there are so many places we could go and look where Jesus is at the right hand of God and he is sitting. I'm going to just turn to a few and for the sake of time, we'll move on. But first of all, here's a real, this is like 
two verses above where Mr. Schofield totally missed it. Look at chapter 3, verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am sat down with my father in his throne. If Mr. Schofield had read chapter 3, verse 21, he wouldn't have been so stupid as to write the note under chapter 4. This is proof that he is not yet sitting on the throne. Are you kidding? It said just in the previous chapter that he is, notice the tense. Even as I also overcame, that's past tense, and am set down. Is that past tense? He's already there. But see, according to a certain doctrine called pre-tribulationism and dispensationalism and Zionism, they don't want it that way for their own reasons, and I don't even want to get into it all tonight. But what does it say in Mark 16 at the end of the Gospel of Mark? Mark 16. Verse 19, so then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Romans 8, 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Look at Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Who is Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Go with me to Hebrews chapter number 10. In the Old Testament temple tabernacle system, the priests were constantly serving. Did you notice in my handout to you tonight, there's not one piece of furniture that is a chair except for the mercy seat and nobody's supposed to sit in that chair. There's no chairs for the priests to sit on because of the Old Testament system, it was never completed. There was never opportunity for them to sit down because they were constantly having to offer atonement and sacrifice for the sins of the people. But once we got our high priest... Once we got Jesus Christ who came and died on the cross and then rose again, he, you know what he did? He became the priest once forever. And it says here in verse 10, 10, 10, 10, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest, human priest, standeth daily, standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. Mr. Schofield says, he's not yet sitting in his seat. Mr. Schofield's wrong. I don't know who, who's, who's Jesus Mr. Schofield worships, but it's not the Jesus of Revelation. He's wrong. And if he's not at the right hand of the Father and he's not with all power and authority, then what is he and why am I praying to him? You see how serious this is? This is wrong. It's very wrong. Now, back in Revelation, and I promise I'm, I'm done. Revelation chapter 5. Someone has said, well, you can't say that the 24 elders represent saints of the Old and New Testament. Because look what it says in Revelation chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou, hast, thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And they say, you see, the, that's not them. They were, they were all Jews. They were Old Testament Israelites and New Testament Jews that got saved and became part of the, of the church and the, the 12 apostles, right? But notice, they had harps and they had one more thing. Verse eight, they had harps and they had a song. And that song was the prayers of the saints. And they were singing, not just their, for themselves, they were singing for all the saints. They were singing for everybody. They were singing a song 
that applies to everybody. You know, you and I, we sing hymnals all the time, and some of the hymns that we sing, they're not necessarily necessarily everything about the hymn applies to us, but in generally speaking, it does. And so we, we I, I don't have a problem with that, but someone might try to argue that. Now, with that in mind, I want to go to page 37 in our hymnal. My understanding is, is that he has dementia now and that he's no longer able to be coherent and to write music. But in my generation, he was a real blessing. And I would have to say that of all the musicians, Christian musicians in my life, Ron Hamilton, better known as Patch the Pirate, uh, probably influenced me more than anybody. And I want you to sing these words with me and ask yourself, where did he get this? He got it right out of Revelation chapter 4 and 5. Let's stand and sing. Page 37, worthy is the lamb. And we'll stop tonight with this. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. Before she starts to play, let me just say, it was a big deal for them to say, so who can open this book? Who is worthy? Who, who has right to open the title deed? Who has ownership? Ownership to everything else that we're going to read in the book of Revelation. Who has the right to open it? Well, Colossians says that he is the creator, that he is the head, and by him all things consist. You know that when Jesus says the earth is going to stop, that's when it'll stop. You know, I think it was Einstein that explained to us the atom and, and, and what else was it, uh, all that, the whatever that E plus two or whatever that E squared, whatever that stuff is and all that and, and the atom and, and all that. Einstein, Einstein explained it, but you know who invented it? Jesus. Jesus, by him all things consist. And he has right. That's why it says, by, for him were all things created and for your pleasure all things were created. It goes back to creation. We had creation in Genesis and now we're seeing creation in, in Revelation. It goes back to that creation. So evolution, of course, is totally against all this. But he has the right to open the seals. He has the right. And so who owns the land? The Jews own the land. The Palestinians own the land. The Lakota own the land. The white people own the land. The black people own the land. No. The lamb owns the land. Submit to him. You know? And worthy is the lamb. Page 37, let's sing it. Weep not,
finally get there? I mean, you talk about wanting to just fall on your knees and start sobbing and just singing, worthy is the lamb. That's what John got to see. He's worthy. And uh, what are in those seven seals? What's he about to open? And, and instead of saying, what's he going to open in the future, like they say in the dispensational pre-tribulation world, what did he start opening 2,000 years ago? What was he, what was, what's this all about? He started opening those seals 2,000 years ago. We're going to study that the next time we get together. So let's close in prayer. We have a short report. I mean, short report, and then we'll be dismissed tonight. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the lamb that has already been slain, that, that makes it no, no longer necessary to have a brazen altar for sacrifices, no longer necessary to have a veil because it's been ripped in two. And now if we'll be, be saved and born again and trust you, we are forever on our way to heaven, eternally guaranteed to be there, sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And we are going to rule and reign with you someday. And all this foolishness on this world really doesn't matter. All those people up there think that all of us down here are really, really silly. Because they know what it's about. They're in the real world. We're in the pretend one. And we thank you, God, that if we have salvation, we have this wonderful place to go to. And we have a Savior, a high priest, the Lamb that was slain for us. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just have a seat real quick. I'll be, I'll be just a few minutes, I promise. <clears throat> I just want to quickly report to you something.